Hey, this is Carla from the Butcher Babies. This is George Corp from the Fisher from Canada Corp. Hey, this is Rex from Kill Devil Hill. It's Wednesday 13. This is Dash from Yellow Dodger. This is Odorous from War. You're listening to Rabbit Noise. On Rabbit Radio. Turn it up. To Rabbit Noise on Rabbit Radio. That was Memory Palace from Between the Buried and Me's latest album, Coma Ecliptic. And the band will be heading back down under for a massive tour at the end of February. And uh, here to talk about all things Between the Buried and Me is the one and only Dan Briggs. Now, i got to say, I'm pretty excited to uh, see you guys next month as I, I sadly missed you on the last time you were here. Uh, but I caught you guys uh, the time before... I believe it was. And that was that was just an amazing show. And, uh, you know, after eight albums, it must get harder for you guys to, like, put a set list together, especially with, like, epic long songs and stuff. Yeah, that does get hard. And, you know, I keep a pretty detailed log that goes back, I think it goes back to 2009, basically of every tour that we've done and the set that we played. And so it's, you know, when we tour on an album, we're generally out for, like, two years at a time. And so we'll play, and you know, we'll play in that area, you know, maybe maybe once or twice per album, and then we'll play maybe like five or so times in America. So it's like it's really important to make sure that you're playing different stuff every time. You know, it, it's a good incentive to make people uh, come out and see you every time because you know they'll know that maybe if they didn't see their favorite song or or something uh, this time that you were out, the next time you know come through, I'll try to try to do it. And I mean that's. That does speak to how much music there is, how long the songs are, and just it's just try to keep it interesting for ourselves as well. We get bored pretty easily, uh, especially playing songs we've played you know hundreds of times already. That's understandable. That's that's totally understandable. I guess it's like you know there's always the fan favorites, but uh, to you it's like oh man we've jammed on this like thousands of times. I guess it'd be like Radiohead playing Creep yeah. every night. You know it's like oh, okay. Oh, you know? I know, but but then you know it's like you know it, it's harder to equate that to to them just because like I look at that as a fan. I'm like, but that's legitimately a great song. Like, of course they should play that, you know. So I get it from the fans' perspective. But yeah, there. I think I think what's so hard is feeling like some of those songs are over a decade old. Mm. You know, something like Selkies or something off Alaska. And uh, you know, for me, I was I was 20 at the time. I'm 31 now, and uh, I just, you know, it's, it's been a long journey and a lot of stuff in between. So if you just you can't really identify with the person that you were at that point, let alone the music that you made at that time, you know, mm. and I feel like, like it just a lot's just happened, you know, you know, the sound and everything since then. So, you know, but yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be playing a mix of stuff this time over. Awesome, man. Yeah, I'm really excited to see you guys again. It's going to be awesome. Well, uh, you know, you guys are, of course, one of the most diverse bands around. And, you know, you've toured with everyone from, you know, Devon Townsend to Cannibal Corpse. You know, which which tour have you found was the most challenging in regards to winning over someone else's crowd? Uh, Probably the tour we did a couple years ago with Coheed and Cambria. And, um, you know, on paper, it, it looked pretty interesting. And um, the shows, the shows were great themselves. Like big crowds, definitely everywhere. And uh, uh, you know, really spoke to how long those guys have been a band, and how how diverse their their fan base is and everything. But you know, there were some nights where uh, you know it was just it was just crickets. You know, be on stage and you're like, wow, this is <laughs> this is not not remotely our crowd. Or remember that the tour ended at. Radio City Music Hall in New York, which is like, you know, the, this crazy huge mm. theater um, where, you know, I think they've done like, you know, the Grammys and the Oscars before and the Rockettes performed there. And and the whole orchestra pit in front were, were clearly the most expensive seats in the house. And they were all clearly their fans because they were just sitting down the oh. whole time we were playing. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, where our sound guy was seated, you know, like way back, like midway up in this theater, you couldn't even see because it was so dark. He was like, he's like, oh, the show was great. It was incredible. And I was like, we couldn't see any of those people. <laughs> like all we saw were these uh-huh. like hundred people right in front of us that were just sitting and, and were so sad just looking at their phones. But, you know, thought- that happens sometimes as a, as a, as a support band, you know? Man, I find that totally unbelievable. Like, because I, 
I'm a, I'm also a, a, a big Coheed fan as well, and uh, seeing you guys together, mm-hmm. you know, as you said on paper, like man, like to me, like I think you guys would be uh, perfect together. I think that you know the fans would be, you know, r- really into it. That's that's really surprising. Yeah, I think that was it was just a handful of days, but it's just you know that one just kind of sticks out in my brain more. I mean, when we when we toured with with Dream Tree, there was the same sort of thing where it was like. You know, the tour in hindsight was really great for us because it, it helped us play to kind of an older crowd that mm. we hadn't uh, quite been accepted by yet. Um, kind of the older prog fans or whatever. That was great, but then, you know, same sort of thing where it was like a lot of the shows were in seated theaters and everyone would be on their feet by the time Opeth played and when Dream Theater played. But, you know, usually for us in the opener, it was, it was just everyone was just kind of sitting down, you know, getting ready for for the rest of the band, so. You know what those old prog yeah. guys can be like. <laughs> Especially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, like, you know, looking back now, it was it, it was good, you know. Oh man, it's you've. I mean, you played with so many awesome bands as well that you know. As I said, you're, you're diverse. You can you could pretty much play with anyone, and uh, I think it would be amazing. Yeah, we've been we've been pretty lucky. I mean, yeah, like you said, everyone from Devon to. Coheed, Cannibal Corpse, Macedon, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's awesome, man. It's it's so good. Uh, you know, not many bands are, are, are that that lucky, I guess, to be able to just slot into to playing with anyone. So yeah, you yeah. Guys, it's, it's awesome, man. Well, uh, you know, the world uh, has lost uh, some amazing people of late, like Lemmy and Bowie and uh, a few others. Uh, who who out of those have has had the biggest impact on you musically? Uh, probably Chris Squire from Yes. Um, you know, I mean, I'm I'm definitely a Bowie fan, and I, and I honestly, I think the Black Star record is is one of his most you know brilliant records. It's incredible, but you know, Yes is a band that's been a part of my makeup for since I was in high school. And uh, Chris Squire, you know, being being the bassist in that band, but also, I mean, he was every uh, every version of the group. He was always like kind of the constant member and one of the main mm-hmm. driving forces. And so I know, you know, in those older songs, you know, he had a big hand in the writing and the arranging and, you know, he sang a lot. Like they did all those crazy layered vocals. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I had no idea because, because Yes was, they, they still stay pretty active. They put out new records and, um, and tour a bit and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was a real bummer, you know, but. It's always sad. I think it's. I saw someone post something recently just about how you know it's sad that you just kind of get into that age where mm. you know the, the the first wave of of you know or rockers from the sixties, seventies, whatever are getting to be like seventy years old or thereabouts, and you know a lot of these guys haven't lived like the easiest <laughs> of lives. You know, yeah, or maybe hard on their bodies at some point in their lives, and. uh you know, it's it's a, it's a bummer, um, but <clears throat> you know, it's it, it, I, I've had that conversation a lot lately with people that it's like the the next generation of of uh, kids they they they're not it's it there's no real big legends like there there was back in the day you know like there's there's no Bowies and right. Lemmys and and stuff like that you know there's people out there writing amazing music but just that big you know. Rock and roll life, you know, it's, uh, it's right. Oh, sad. yeah. You know, that larger than life. It's, it's definitely, you know, I, I'm not a Kanye West fan, so I don't think, uh, <laughs> I think, I don't think that's going to be, you know, something that's going to be for yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just me. Well, uh, I also heard you're a Star Wars fan. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I was, uh, I went, uh, I went opening week, not opening weekend, but, uh, yeah, I've seen it twice. I saw it. Uh, I saw it in IMAX. It was it was incredible. I mean, okay. So I, you... I thought I thought it was great. I, I had a, I had no real problems with it. See, yeah, neither did I. I loved it. So, in in order of the whole Star Wars saga, where would you rate them, highest to lowest? Oh, especially after seeing it the second time. I mean, I I put it after after Empire for me. I mean, it's I I thought it was great. I really did. Um. It was just, it was like the right mix of, you know, being a more modern movie, but having the warm feel of those original movies. You know, I, I had read how 
George Lucas had kind of panned it because they made an old movie or whatever. But, you know, I mean, he's such an innovator, you know, mm. you can't really talk bad on, on George Lucas. But I don't think he realized that everyone kind of yearned for, you know, spaceships that were actually like they were they were real like like <laughs> like models like like you know they actually made those and, and the robots were real they they weren't just cg you know they're guys in, in suits or there was puppets and stuff like that's awesome that's so cool yeah i that's the thing i loved about it too uh do you do you still collect do you collect star wars stuff as well no no i, n- I never i never got that into it no so do you do you, do you have uh, a nerdy habit like uh do you collect anything you know um, well, you know, I, I feel like I do, but I don't, I'm, I'm huge. I don't consider it like, like a, a collecting hobby, but I've, you know, my, my CD collection and my, my records, you know, I've, I never really stopped buying those, you know, I got into it, you know, when, in the mid nineties, I think mm. my, my first CD I bought was Green Day's Dookie when it came out. Me too. 94, 95. And yeah, and it just, it just never stopped. So, um, I, I guess I understand with, you know, the the ways that streaming music and all that has kind of come into play that it's kind of changed how people get their music and whatever. Mm. I don't actually subscribe. I don't, I don't have Spotify. I don't have Apple Music. The only thing I've ever bought on iTunes or podcasts. Um, I just, since I was a kid, I've just been so excited to have, to have this thing and to open it up and to see the credits and look at the art. And uh, there was a period when I was... I mean, you know, really from the time I was in high school through college where I was, you know, I had no money. So, you know, I was, I was Napstering a lot. I was, you know, exploring music that way, but I knew as soon as I could afford it and I could get back into it, I would, I'd be buying, you know, everything. And there was a period where I was, when I first started buying records where I was buying a lot of stuff that, uh, that I was, I was into when I was in high school and college and, uh, and that just kind of catapulted from there. So you've uh, do you do you have them all on display? Do you like have them all in alphabetical oh, I've order? Got, I mean, they're in alphabetical and sequential. Yeah, that's the way. It drives me nuts when you go to someone's house and they've just got their CDs like just chucked into any old, you know. They'll... Oh <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, no, it's, no. My 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 VHS and my DVDs are arranged like that as well. And yeah, that just kind of makes sense to me. But maybe I got that from my dad as well. I don't know. I just, I just, it just kind of makes sense to me, I guess. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think just... the hard part would be if I, if I owned a record store, I think it would be really hard for me to not arrange the records like that as well. Yeah, yeah. I probably it, couldn't own the record. Store. Oh, it, it'd drive me nuts. It'd drive me nuts. <laughs> I'm a bit OCD like yeah. that. I think. <laughs> Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's awesome, man. Well, uh, we're going to go to the track, the Coma Machine. Now, thanks for hanging tonight, man. And uh, we'll see you in Brisbane on February twenty-seven at Max Watts. Killer. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Oh, that's all good, man. That's all good. All right. Thanks, man. See ya. Thanks, brother. Bye. Hey guys, just want to take a minute to give a shout out to our podcast supporters, RW Promotion, who are the best in the business when it comes to printing posters, flyers, banners, badges, business cards, you name it. They've got what it takes to help you get everything you need to help spread the word about your band or business. And uh, with a blistering turnaround, they'll make sure you get your product ASAP. So get in touch with Richard and the team at www.rwpromotion.com.au or shoot them an email at info at rwpromotion.com.au. Also want to give a shout out to the guys at Blacklight Art and Design, who in my opinion are the Gold Coast best screen printers. So, uh, you know, we've gotten many band shirts and even our own Rabid Noise shirts done through these guys. And uh, they've also got one of the fastest turnarounds I've ever seen. So all quality prints at competitive prices. Uh, so whether it's band merchandise, sporting teams, promotional garments or workwear, you know, they've got you covered. So hit them up at www.blacklight.com lightad.com.au or email them at info at blacklightad.com.au so big thanks to those guys for helping us to bring you this podcast each and every week and for of course supporting the metal scene